Well, hello, everyone. My name is Tommy Lee of A21, and I get a chance to sit down with my team member, Christian Elliott from A21 in the UK. So, Christian, how are you? I'm good. How are you, Tommy? Great to uh, hear from you as always. Yeah. Now, Christian, for those who may not know about your role, what's your role mm. at A21? <laughs> well, it's one of like I think anyone who's worked in an NGO knows you 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 have a, a role. My role is development director, um, which means I I help raise funds and things like that. But to be honest, I've I've been around for eight years now. <laughs> I've done everything. I mean, I've been a creative director. I've done a bit of executive development, uh, strategic work, set up a, a new country, and bits of whatever needs to be done. I'm here to do it. For those who, some of you may already who are listening may be familiar with Christian Elliott because a couple, uh, about a month ago, we actually did a round table with Bethany Huang and Christian. I will link yeah. this, that conversation that we had to it. And there Christian shared a little bit of his story. But for Christian, just to regroup and for those who may not know again, you live in the UK and was A21 one of your first job or talk a little bit about your journey before you yeah. got to A21. Yeah, it's uh, it's um, it's quite a long and protracted story, as are most stories. But I think to give you the the, the long and short of it, um, <laughs> I was a bit unusual. I was born into a, a family of drummers and and music producers and things like that, and so you know, I always thought that I was going to be a drummer. Um, my dad was in bands like The Who and played with Paul McCartney, the Alan Parsons Project, Kate Bush. He was like one of the top session drummers in the world. My granddad was with Lena Horn, who's a famous sing singer in the 20s, or even before that, actually, and uh, worked with Frank Sinatra and different people. And, um, you know, I kind of thought I was going to be a drummer. I mean, that was it for me. You know, I mean, my uncle was a drummer. My dad's a drummer. They all, they all play something. So naturally, I thought that's what I was going to do. And I sort of embarked on that journey. And... Um, you know, when you have a a vision of yourself, I think God has a greater vision of you that you're not aware of. And certainly in your younger days, as George Bernard Shaw says, youth is wasted somewhat on the young. And uh, it wasn't until I got to um, sort of my, my mid-20s, I'd been playing with some bands, you know, I'd worked with different artists and things, done some of my dad's legacy stuff, and that was, that was fun. Um, but I, I learned how to hack. I know that sounds like a strange combination to be a uh, professional musician and then um, and then hack. And that came about because I I went to live in Seoul in Korea, and I spent um, I spent about a year there. I was actually studying, and um, I was also working with different artists and things like that. So I was on like a late night show as a drummer. Yeah. I was playing with different art Korean pop stars and things like that. It was kind of fun. And um, and I and. And when I left, I went left Korea, I, I actually left with a purpose to go to Australia, thinking I was going to do a bunch more music. And I had an album planned with a with a dear friend of mine. And I ended up going to Australia and the and the record company pulled out of uh, of the album. And so we didn't we didn't have an album to do. And I'm like, I've just emigrated to Australia from from Korea, where I had a really bustling career with K-pop, which, you know, was kind of fun, actually. And then um, I found myself in Australia and um I'm jobless. <laughs> so I'm like, what do I do? Do I go back to London or do I go back to Korea? Anyway, I started I started picking up computers and sort of the internet was a thing then. I got my first email address. I think I was 24 at the time, actually. And um, I learned how from, from some friends of mine how to hack. And um, I ended up getting a job, my first proper job in a company called Nortel Networks. It was actually called Bay Networks then. And um, I was working with a bunch of engineers who were just, you know, super nerdy. And I really enjoyed it. You know, I kind of I've always been into electronics and things like that. I always loved music, but electronics was the next thing. And so I learned how to hack and, and, um, and, and you know, I, I kind of got really good at it. <laughs> and so uh, when I, when I um, finally, after a year of working there, I came back to London, I, um, I got a contract from a company at the time called Yellow Pages. I think you have white pages. Actually, you have, you have yellow pages in America, or you used to. Yeah. In fact, all the American content and all the UK content lived in a, in a data center called Thiel. I basically propositioned the uh, manager, and I said, look, I, I can break into your system, show you where your vulnerabilities are, and if I do so, um, would you let me rebuild your network? 
And so, <laughs> cut a long story short, caught, I hacked in, got, got a contract, hacked in into the American servers and the UK servers, and I got to rebuild their entire network with some of the latest technology. And so I built a business off the back of that for about um, six, six years. Oh, um, yeah. And at the same time, I was still playing drums, I was playing, but I was more playing drums in church with people like Matt Redman and Natasha Beddingfield and, you know, Hillsong, Darlene Check, and all these guys. And I was really loving music again. You know, so I've gone from being doing session work, which I found kind of stressful, didn't like the music I was playing, to be honest. And now I've sort of got a business. You know, I'm, 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 you know, I've gone from the Yellow Pages thing and a couple of years into it, you know, I, I'm working with government. I'm working with the British government. I rebuilt, actually, just out of interest, the uh, Scotland Yard, or, or certainly bits of the the main parts of the infrastructure, and and then went on to do agencies and all kinds of stuff, and and international agencies as well. Yeah. Um, it got into that period. I'm sorry, I have to tell you that the back that's the kind of the backstory, and this is the yeah. sort of mystery of you know how how God sort of um disrupts what we think is the path to where we want to go and it was in that time that i kind of very quickly got disillusioned with making money you know I, the, the thrill of hacking had kind of worn off it was business you know i get to play in church and i get to play drums which is wonderful but i'm like something's missing i just feel like i need to do something and so i took a week off work and i prayed and i was asking god to show me and it was actually somebody it was a good friend of mine and and she was she was also in church called Natasha Beddingfield and her mother was starting a charity called Global Angels and I said could I help you you know I'd love to help I've got an office I've got resources let's, let's get it up and running and so I set this um, um, helped and assisted her to set up the charity Global Angels in the UK and get it branded and looking cool it's still going now you can see it at globalangels.org and um, the thing, the prem, the thing about Global Angels, which is really, which is really cool, is that they give a hundred percent of their donations away, and um, and and basically the 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 breadth of their work is everything to do with children, you know. So whether whether that be poverty, or cleft palates, or operations that are needed, and there was this one thing that we did, which was about human trafficking, and it was specifically in India. And I got sort of, I remember in two thousand and four, thinking to myself, my goodness this is huge. How comes I didn't know about this? And so it haunted me and I just couldn't get it off out of my head. And so um, we get to 2006 and Tasha's brother, Daniel Beddingfield, wants to use his, um, his notoriety for, for a cause. And he goes to a gentleman by the name of Steve Chalk and he says, you know what, what can I do for my you know, notoriety? To, to, to raise you know money and to raise influence and to help a bunch of people and and it was Steve's suggestion that he did uh, that we focused on trafficking. I was invited into that group um, uh, of which was essentially a campaign to raise a million signatures. It was pre Facebook and we ended up doing concerts and different fundraising and public events, public stunts and we got actually got two million signatures, wow. which was really yeah. cool. And so, um, you know, as a result of that, that put human trafficking, um, I say, on the map in that it was more prioritized because in those days, um, human trafficking wasn't really a central priority. There were many things that, were, that, that came above that. So it was a very low down in the pecking order. Um, but, you know, with, with this massive campaign called Stop the Traffic, and, and by the way, that took place uh, because it was the 200th... Um, uh, the bicentenary of the abolition of the transatlantic slave movement that was uh, spearheaded by um, uh, by the British government, and um, and so this was an opportunity to talk about slavery as a whole, but but not just transatlantic slavery of the past, but um, of what's happening now and what we call modern day slavery. So after we did that, you know, the campaign went on to become a, an organisation. Um, which was wonderful. Um, I then went on to start a little agency, which was working with the with the Thai government and different different places to basically work on policy, to work on intervention for children, to just sort of see what what what's going on out there, and and to set up offices and things like that. And um, and that kind of you know that that was very 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 difficult because it was at a time, as I say, where it wasn't really a priority anywhere. Yes, we'd have this landslide would stop the traffic 
the, the whole world was just, there was nothing going on. And I remember sitting in interviews um, with the police in Thailand and Cambodia. And, and, you know, I remember this one incident that just completely rocked me where they brought in this little boy. It, it was because we were going to do a big concert for the king of Thailand at the time. And so I went there and because I was going uh, on instruction of this concert, which involved the royal family, that put me, thrust me into a position to be working with the generals because anything you do with the royal family, it's obviously very prestigious and they want to check that you're, you know, you're not dodgy basically. So they follow you around and they work with you and they sort of extrapolate information. And of course, when they learned about the fact that it's to bring raise awareness for human trafficking, they brought me into some of their investigations. Now, the sad thing about that was, is that, you know, I remember going into an investigation and going into a room and there were seven police officers all fully uniformed, you know, the whole, the whole shebang. And they, they bring in this little boy who's, I must have been five or six mm. years old. And um, he then, uh, the, the, the officer in charge says, oh, tell Christian what happened to you. And I'm like, I, I, internally I'm dying. So I'm like, this little boy, he's just been through the worst thing yeah. you can imagine, right? And, he's, and this little boy then relays in Thai, it was translated to me, what happened to him. I won't repeat some of the atrocities that he told me that happened to him, but rest assured that they were disturbing. And, um, and I thought to myself, my goodness, if this is what, what, you know, what we do with victims, I, I mean, I, I don't understand. I don't, I don't know how, how, there's a, how there's hope here. That was in 2008. And, um, you know, I think it was funny because I, I got to see that then. And obviously you told me you've been to Thailand and Cambodia you know, back in those days, there weren't any prosecutions for child trafficking, none at all. And so I was like, to be honest with you, I was quite broken and it was just quite a dis desperate situation. And I, in the end, I, I, I did a few things in Burma. You know, I went into um, uh, places like uh, the Shan State and negotiated with rebel leaders to uh, increase the age of conscripts going to war. So I, I did a fair bit there with, with child soldiers and the, and the trafficking of children. Um, but in the end, it was such a heavy toll on me. And I found it so hard to just maintain all this and pay for it. I made a little bit of money, but you can imagine how quickly that money was going, right? Yeah. Um, but so I, I sort of stopped. I stopped in around, I think it was around 2014. Um, and it wasn't until, um, no, 2012. And then I started with A21 again in 2014. And then, you know, there was this massive shift. I mean, there was such a favor. Well, there is such a favor on A21. When it started, all the stuff that I had learned, I was able to sort of, you know, Nick and Chris kindly sort of brought me in and, and said, look, you've learned this stuff. You've got these opportunities. You've got these contacts. You know the context really well. Why don't you come and join us? Mm. And um, and Nick and Christine just kept saying to me, "So when do we start in Thailand? When do we start in Thailand?" And she just kept on, and it was like, "I don't want to go back there. I don't want to do this again." You know, and so that's that's a little bit of context. A bit of a, I told you it was a long story, but I I've cut out a lot of bits. But that's really the essence of how I got to A twenty one, and uh, yeah, it's been it's been really thrilling since. Got it. Talk a little bit about A21 and some of the things that you've worked on. You started the I, uh, Can You See Me campaign. You've traveled. Sure. You've promoted. Talk a little bit more about the work of A21 and some of the projects that you're involved in. Yeah, sure. Um, so 18, uh, A21 is in 18 locations, 13 countries worldwide. Um, we basically, if you were to break it down to simple terms, there's the reach component, the rescue component, and the restore component. If we're talking about reach, we're talking about literally reaching people through campaigns, through education, um, through ways in which we can bring awareness to the public and, and to tell them about the subject matter at large. So within reach, we have things like Can You See Me, which is a, um, well, it's a multi-purpose campaign. It's an awareness campaign, but it's an awareness campaign with action that's had just such favor upon it. I mean, we've, we're all over all over the world now, started here in the UK. There's a whole story behind that, but I won't go into can, can You See Me Now, but it's very much widespread now as a, as a campaign to bring awareness to the contextualization of trafficking you know, in each individual scenario, whether that's sex trafficking or uh, domestic servitude or forced labor or online child sexual exploitation. I mean, there's so many different forms of trafficking, right? So 
these videos and billboards and posters kind of you know bring that to life and and bring it to life in a way that people can see behind the curtains so how the victim got there you know what what the perpetrators do and how they coerce them how they force them into situations that they didn't want to be in and 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 furthermore yes it brings that awareness it brings that insight and it shows people the indicators but it also shows them and the slogan at the end is you know, if you suspect it report it and then it gives mm. you a telephone number to call because you know as human beings we all have this innate suspicion that lives within us we have this detector and quite often we just shrug it off and you go well pff, i mean it's not my business or ah uh, it's probably nothing but that's what a hotline exists for is to is for to call so there's the there's there's that element we do a one of the biggest sporting campaigns uh, sorry biggest trafficking campaigns in sport called it's a penalty we partner with that with another organization essentially that is uh, every big major sporting events like the super bowl rugby sevens cover wealth games um world cup olympics and we're you know we're on all the in-flight entertainment of you know big big brands like american airlines british airways and a bunch of other airlines are on billboards posters in hotels in uber taxis and things like that again to bring um to bring you know awareness to the cause but to get people to take action because that's it if we can get people to be the eyes and ears if we can educate yeah. people to that level where they become the eyes and ears it makes it so much harder for a trafficker uh, to coerce and threaten and keep a, a victim silent so that's rescue that uh, reach on the on the, the the rescue side you know we run um, I mentioned hotlines, but we run national hotlines as well in, in some of our locations, um, Greece, Bulgaria, uh, South Africa. And we lo we're looking to implement more in Ukraine and other countries, um, but they're national. So, you know, that's the go to number that people will call if they suspect human trafficking. And, um, you know, the great thing about that is it doesn't matter what you say. We do the triage. We do the sorting. We find where the cases are and then we connect we connect the dots work with law enforcement and you know we have we have real a very strong in our rescue component we have very very strong relationships with with law enforcement and agencies investigative agencies that actually go in and you know perform the interventions for our um our victims but um but also within that and as you saw in Tom, you saw tommy and just following on from you know, my my devastation of my original sort of exposure to Thailand, we now run something called the CAC, Child Advocacy Center, which yeah. essentially is a, a place where we do forensics. Our social workers are trained forensically, we'll collect the witness statement, we'll work with the police to package the witness statement so it goes to the prosecutor, you know, as as as, as together as we possibly can. And and and, and as a result of that rather than, you know, versus the little boy brought into the room telling his story and nothing happening, you know, we represent that legal process really well. We yeah. don't have to keep bringing the child in front of people to tell their story and over again. We record it with, you know, high-tech equipment. So it's a one-time thing. I mean, in, in Thailand, you have to, and Cambodia, you still have to testify at the end, but at least you don't get constantly, you know, yeah. under barrage from different people to asking you questions. It's done on videotape. It's a one-time thing. So, so that's been hugely successful. We've seen, I don't know how many prosecutions now. I mean, we're not just low-level prosecutions of mama sons and low-level yeah. traffickers. We're talking like, you know, policemen and, you know, <clears throat> you know, very, very high-ranking officials and things like that. So that's been super, super good. But then obviously the, for us, you Thank know, you. Hold you, yeah. uh, can I stop you on that one point? Okay. It seems like this advocacy center yes. was is a direct result of everything that you learned not to do during your first case. Exactly, yeah, exactly, yeah. Well, yeah, and you know, it was so funny because, you know, just to, you know, just to put a spiritual angle on it, I, I, I thought it was a desperate situation, but actually I was given the opportunity to go back and with a with a you know with, with great people actually provide a solution and, and then you know there are other people in thailand that are doing great things don't get me wrong and there's been a lot of people doing a, a lot of work but we were able to slot into this piece and for me it was a really important piece because when when a when a victim um, becomes a survivor the thing that really changes them and helps them to go into independence is knowing that the people that have perpetrated against them the people that have done bad things to them you know have gone to jail or have you know have been punished for for what they've done it's a really important part piece of the puzzle
Got it. Hey, now, Christian, let me ask you, like, you know this, with the centers, why do you guys have to have a separate, or why does H21 have to have a separate center? Why can't you just equip the police with training? You still bring the kids or whoever it is to the police station, upgraded mm -hmm. equipment, train, all of that stuff. Why is the centers so key to the whole process? Well, I mean, the CAC is is kind of a collaboration between a task force um, and, mm -hmm. and the charitable aspect of it so the, yeah. the, the work of the police isn't really that of a social worker there you know i mean it's, it's unreasonable i think to expect that a policeman to be trained as a social worker is a separate is a very you know separate skill um so that that collaborative effort so the police can do what they do best with with us where we do what we do best and in this case it's it's forensically trained social workers so it's it's providing that care that love that 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 feeling of safety for the child is so important you know when you go into a police station it's scary and they're, they're designed like that they're designed to deal with criminals to bring children into a police station i mean it's just yes they used to do that and it used to be like horrendous but the point of the center is it's a child-friendly location. It's got toys. It's got lovely people. It's got smiles. It feels light, you know, and, and, and it's, it's designed for them. And within that environment, they can then tell their story with people that they're learning to trust as opposed to being moved around from one police officer to the next, depending on who's their sh on their shift, right? So it's centralized, it's child-friendly, and it's designed for their care, their holistic care. Yeah. And Christian, one of the things I've noticed, especially with these centers, when I went to Cambodia and Thailand, how important and key it is to develop good relations with the government. You have to work That's right. in line with the government. So true. Yeah. I mean, I mean, I've seen even nowadays, I kind of see people out there you know, trying to do their own thing, um, like going into brothels and, you know, taking pictures and stuff like that it's just too dangerous it's too yeah, dodgy yeah. And so at, the, at the end of the day that's kind of the work of a vigilante you wouldn't do that in your own country so why would you go to southeast asia for example and you know <laughs> you're a plumber in, in in america right and you go to um to burma or thailand or cambodia and you start going to brothels I mean, it doesn't make sense i know people have great intentions but it's like great intentions isn't 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 good enough you know we we decided very early on there was nothing that we would do will be vigilante or we're not going to take anything into our own hands it's all about advocating on behalf of the victim it's all about encouraging the police to do their job and supporting them so that they can do it well as i said they can't be social workers and be policemen it's it's not possible yes you they, you get kind policemen who have capacity but we can't put that on them so um yeah no the 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 the, the relationship with government and it, 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 you know, and the people who have jurisdiction in their country and their culture is incredibly important for us to align with before we do anything. Yeah. Christian, uh, uh, as we're sitting here recording right now, it is a couple of days before the Super Bowl. A yeah. year ago, you start uh, developing a relationship with the NFL, did a campaign with the uh, Super Bowl and all of, and even now with major sporting events. Talk a little yeah. bit about that. Yeah, that's been a really interesting journey, actually. I mean, I mean, when we started the campaign that I mentioned earlier, it's a penalty. Um, never really kind of realized how big it would become. Um, you see, in the early days, I mean, I, I remember doing my first campaign at a Super Bowl. It was gun related. It, it wasn't it wasn't this. It was something else. And I remember it getting quite a lot of backlash because the danger that you have around sporting events is, you know, like, like the world cup was the first one we did, for example. Um, you know, I think it's one of the greatest, you know, competitions ever. And I, and I think that if you're American, you probably think Super Bowl is the greatest as well. And they, and, and then to you, they probably are. And if someone comes along and kind of accuses or, or you feel like we're, we're accusing um, people who love sport of trafficking, you know, there's a message there that can get kind of mixed up. So the first time I did it, it wasn't it wasn't deliberate but i think people kind of felt that you know why are you attacking sporting events well it's not that we're attacking sporting events far from it you know the super bowl is i've learned to love it actually i think it's i think it's a, a absolutely awesome and and electric i mean it's just in incredible but the thing is and the sad thing is you know people who see an opportunity uh who see who see a monetary opportunity um will do anything uh, to monetize that opportunity so where you have a lot of people gathered 
and and sporting events are all those things in particular where there tends to be a lot of men um traffickers come in and they bring in they bring in extra women they force people into um into a situation where they have to you know be available to service men quite often those women are are children they're minors um you know in, in america we're talking about a, a huge percentage of people um of children that, that are runaway children go missing completely never to be found again and and a lot of these children end up in the sex trade and so when it comes to these big events you know we want to get we want to make people aware not only by our own voice and so you you'll know like getting a you know like an aaron rogers for example is one of the guys who supports what we're doing and andy dalton and benjamin watson big guys and all quarterbacks in um, actually benjamin's not a quarterback he's a I, what do you call it a tight something tight end tight end yes yeah. <laughs> excuse me um and, and we've got a bunch of other quarterbacks as well who 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 talk about it you know they they come on on onto the onto the news and they come on to our psa talking about how serious this issue is and how as men and as people we need to be looking out for it and you know the whole premise of it's a penalty is that if you're caught doing something like this you know expect there to be a penalty and and what's attached to that as well you know because there's a lot of the there's a lot of international trafficking that happens um or, or rather should i say perpetrators or or what you might call in america i think you call them johns when they go to these events they go from different countries and um and uh, to give to give an example in in america you have something called the protect act of 2003 we have section 72 in our legislation but it essentially means that if you commit a crime uh, against a child um through extraterritorial legislation that person will not only be tried in their home country sorry the country where they perpetrated against their child but when they go back to their home country they can be tried there so so it's a penalty has has two two sides to it it's the extraterritorial legislation and promoting that around the world out of all the countries about 40 countries have signed up which essentially is you know contractual reciprocal arrangements between governments that basically says we're going to protect kids. You know, you're caught doing this. We will work with your government where you come from, so you get the full, um, the full penalty for for what you've done. Um, and then, of course, there's the front end where you're telling people to look out for it, to look out for exploitation, and report it. And we get a lot of reports as a result of people seeing these advertisements. People report, and that gives us cases. And and this is what it's all about. Yeah, yeah, wow, wonderful. Hey, Christian, in the last few minutes as well, too, is we talk a lot, especially now during the pandemic, the whole idea of mental health, emotional health, yeah. all of this stuff. For you and even all of the staff, as you continue to, uh, uh, who is on the ground working, as we see all of these things, how do you continue to keep your mind focused? How do you find hope in the midst of all these different things? Yeah. And are you even seeing hope? I mean, dude, yeah. is, is it so rampage with all of these people doing these things? Is mm. are you seeing a dent into what's going on? Well, I I have I have the unique advantage because it's been a long time, you know, a long stretch, more than 10 years. I'm able to see the before and after, and Thailand's a great example of that. So when you see change, when you see it coming, and and you can quantify it, and you can put your finger on it, then that gives you hope. And actually, I have to say, in the even people that have been with us for a short time, you know, we have we have tremendous reports, um, you know, monthly reports of stuff that's happening. So, you know, all of our staff at A21 are, are always encouraged. Um, to look to the future you know we have a resolute goal that we want to end slavery everywhere forever and you know everyone believes that and we do believe that because we believe it's possible and if it isn't doesn't happen in our lifetime it's going to happen in our kids lifetime it's going to happen and that's what we're working towards and i think when you have uh, a very resolute goal like that you can handle a lot more now i have to say as with what i do i don't i'm not involved in our aftercare one thing i missed from that retrust you and restore was the restore part now for me i don't 
you know, most of us don't get involved with, with the victims or what we call survivors, but we do have dedicated staff who do, and, they, and they're involved in the holistic care of those individuals. So we have psychotherapists, we have psychologists, we have doctors who work with us. Um, you know, Rhiannon Bell is a doctor and she's a psychologist and she runs our aftercare for H21, does an, an amazing job. But, you know, there's also counseling for um, our key staff workers who, who are involved with these people. Actually, there's counseling available for all of us if we want it. So, you know, if there's any if there's any triggers or anything like that, we you know, we have places to go. For me, I'm 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 just so I'm like you. I'm just focused on the goal. So I, I I'm I'm just that's that's, you know, that's my therapy, knowing the, where we're going and um, and going there resolute is 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 my therapy but i think some people you know they it's a lot tougher because they're having to interview a child and you know that's super tough that's super tough so we really we do check in on our aftercare staff and we do have a process for that um especially with with the kind of things that they're dealing with yeah and christian last final question i i think i should start this at the beginning a21 people you know it i know it what does a21 mean what does it stand for yeah, yeah, it's um, well, it's, it was quite a long-winded URL when it first started, which is uh, a, a, the abolishment of slavery in the twenty-first century. If you stick dot com on the end of that, you, people are going to be a bit stumped. So uh, we thought we'd shorten it to A twenty-one. <laughs> so, so did you not know that, Toby? I did not know that. <laughs> <laughs> okay yeah it's sort of a21 is kind of random it's really funny because every time i get a plane now i don't know what it is at heathrow i always end up on the the a21 area for going in to catch my plane <laughs> or a train station it's so weird i was on the a i was driving on the a21 the other day so oh my god is. i did not know that yeah you know i think one of my trips with you guys i asked bill one of our teammates bill yeah. what does a21 mean and yeah, it's thank you so much for sharing that. <laughs> it's okay. Yeah, it's awesome. Okay. Hey, uh, Christian, thank you so much. I know a lot of times it is afternoon. It's getting ready for dinner. So thank you for taking some time to talk. My pleasure. Enjoyed it immensely. All right. Talk soon, Christian.